Well, the Lord's Supper was instituted at Passover time, and it's the very night when Judas betrayed Jesus that Jesus established that, that practice, which is where we find ourselves in the, the book of John. John chapter 13, it is the Last Supper. It's also Passover. Now, remember, Passover was a celebration of what God did for the Israelites when he brought them out of Egypt, and the very last plague, the death angel, uh, people were spared by taking a lamb and putting the blood on the doorpost, and the Lord would pass over them. And so they were saved by the blood of the lamb, which is exactly what we find in the New Testament, a picture of what was to come. Passover really was looking forward to Jesus. And so it's on this very night in John chapter 13 where Jesus is going to institute the Lord's Supper. But before that, a couple things happen. First of all, last week we looked at the fact that Jesus at that, that dinner, he got up from the table and went and he washed all the disciples' feet, showing them the full extent of his love. He washed the disciples' feet, including the feet of the very one who would betray him, Judas. And throughout that night... Jesus keeps extending his love even to Judas. And as I look at this passage, I see over and over again Jesus' attempt to demonstrate the full extent of his love. But that's where we find ourselves. Jesus has just washed the feet of the disciples. He's just made this statement. Not all of you are clean. And he was talking about Judas, who that very night would betray him. And that's where we pick up our story when we get get down to verse 18. We read this. I'm not speaking of all of you. I know whom I've chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. And I'm telling you this now before it takes place, that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send receives me, and whoever receives me receives the one who sent me. After saying these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit and testified, truly, truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at one another, uncertain of whom he spoke. One of his disciples, whom Jesus loved, was reclining at table close to Jesus. So Simon Peter motioned to him to ask Jesus of whom he was speaking. So that disciple, leaning back against Jesus, said to him, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, it's he to whom I'll give this morsel of bread when I've dipped it. So when he had dipped the morsel, he gave it to Judas, the son of Simon Iscariot. Then after he had taken the morsel, Satan entered into him. Jesus said to him, what you're going to do, do quickly. Now, no one at the table knew why he said this to him. Some thought that because Judas had the money bag, Jesus was telling him, buy what we need for the feast, or that he should give something to the poor. So after receiving the morsel of bread, he immediately went out, and it was night. Actually, those last, those last four words caught my attention. It was night. It serves kind of a sad commentary, doesn't it? Now, it is a, it's a... Although those words recount for us not only the actual situation, it was night, but also they seem kind of symbolic here, that it's midnight on Judas' soul. It's at this moment Judas is going to go out and betray Jesus. It was a dark moment. It's interesting that the other gospel writers also recount for us, and it was winter. And the same type of thing, it's a cold, dark day when Judas goes out to betray Jesus. Jesus. And so it is the midnight of Judas' soul. And Judas, that villain, becomes the focal point of our story. And I want to suggest to you quite a contrast is being painted for us. We've just seen Jesus washing the feet of the disciples. We see Jesus pouring out his love, Jesus humbly serving, while Judas, he's wanting his own way. He's seeking his own interest. Really, he's trying to force his own agenda. We see Jesus, who's walking in the light. We see Judas, it was a dark night. He, he's walking in darkness. We see Jesus filled with compassion. We see Judas filled with treachery. And so I want to suggest to you, those are apt descriptions, that it was night. But before we go a little deeper, I've got to stop and remind you some more of the background of the Last Supper or Passover, the night Jesus was betrayed, the night that Jesus initiated the Lord's Supper. Uh, but we, we, we see pictures of this Last Supper. In fact, you probably can even picture Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper, right? His painting, i got to say, didn't quite get that right. He's got them sitting at the table. He's got Jesus right at the middle of the table. That's not how it happened. In fact, we read in our scripture, they're actually reclining, which if you read elsewhere, you're going to find out they're reclining on couches, which I'm 
need to stop and say, hey, there's some precedent to eating dinner, you know, laying on the couch. Um, it's, it's, it's biblical, watching football, uh, maybe not that part. But they're reclining at the table. Now, they didn't recline at every meal, so don't get that, that idea. It was a special occasion. But they did recline at this one. The reason why they did this, they, they reclined at Passover. This actually is a very leisurely, it's also a very lengthy meal, which served as a deliberate contrast. You see, they're celebrating Passover, so I've got to take you back and remind you of what Passover was like. Passover, clear back in the days of Egypt, when God's going to rescue them, the children of Israel, from Egypt. At that first Passover, actually, the instructions were quite different. They were supposed to eat this meal in haste. Uh, They were really supposed to be prepared to go at an instant. And so the very first Passover, God says, you be ready because in an instant, we're going to leave this place. And so they were given instructions about how to prepare the meal, also how to eat the meal. And we find that in Exodus chapter 12, verse 11. This is the manner they're supposed to eat the Passover. They're supposed to have their belt fastened. They're supposed to have their sandals on their feet ready to go and a staff in their hand. They're going to make a journey. They're supposed to eat this meal in haste. God's going to deliver them. They've got to be ready to be saved, to be rescued by God. And so the first Passover was a very quick meal where they're supposed to be prepared and ready to go. But all the other Passovers after that, they actually did the reverse. They thought, God has rescued us. We want to celebrate and enjoy what God has done for us. And so in deliberate contrast, this was a lengthy meal. This was a drawn-out meal. This was a meal where they actually reclined at the table. Now, the the table is different than than we see in da Vinci's painting. Rather than just a a normal table, it's actually a U-shaped table. And rather than Jesus sitting right in the middle of the table, actually the host would sit on the left side of the table. And here's something important for you to realize. There are two places of honor. Imagine this. You're laying at a table. You're laying on a couch, your feet away from the table, and you're actually reclining on your left arm. That way you can eat with your right arm. And so if you picture that, you're laying on your left arm with your legs extended. The person right behind you to your your left is actually the seat of honor. That's where Judas is. Now just hear what I said. Who's sitting in a place of honor? It's Judas. And in front of him, we find the disciple John. That's actually the next person in terms of honor at the table. And it's as if Jesus is stopping to say, Judas, don't you realize you're special to me? Judas, I know what you're going to do, but I'm going to sit you at the place of honor. He's already washed the feet of the disciples, including Judas, and now he puts Judas at the very at the very place of honor at the table, the most honored position. So the schematic actually goes like this, and you'll see a U-shaped table here, and we see Jesus at the host position. We see Judas to his left and John to his right. Now, what's interesting is Peter has to motion from across the way to get John to ask Jesus something. It's interesting because likely Peter is clear on the other side of the table, which, by the way, is not the position of honor. Actually, it's the lowest place of the table, which is in stark contrast to what some people think about who Peter is. Interesting that he's not at the place of honor, but Judas is. Isn't that just kind of a, uh, an interesting thing here, that he is in the honored spot? I think Jesus is doing this intentionally. I think Jesus is reaching out one last time to Judas saying, do you understand who you are? You're important to me. But as they're at this table, we realize before the meal begins, Jesus speaks, and he again is going to tell about his betrayer. It's a dark moment. It was night. And we see darkness foretold. Jesus says this, the scripture will be fulfilled tonight. He who ate my bread has lifted his heel against me. He's he's saying there's somebody here that's going to betray me. Now, he's done this before. If we go back to the book of John, we're going to realize he has repeatedly warned about the treachery of someone among the 12. There's someone within his ranks who will betray him. And so we can go back and, and we can see passages like John chapter 6, for example, uh, don't, don't you know I chose you, and yet one of you is a devil. One of you is going to betray me. And so he's given, and there's other passages in John, where he's already hinted, he's alluded to the fact that one among them is going to betray, betray Jesus. But then Jesus does something interesting. He actually goes back to the Old Testament and says, do you realize that this night has actually been foretold? He goes back and he adopts a story that was actually originally of King David, King David, while he was king, his son tried to overthrow him. His son's name was Absalom. And Absalom was trying to 
usurp the authority of the throne. And one of David's own counselors actually turned against David. His name was Ahithophel. Now, sounds like a sneeze, doesn't it? Ahithophel. But that's his, his name. He was one of the trusted counselors, and he actually goes to counsel the enemy of David, his son who's trying to overthrow him. Now, David finds out about this, and David actually prays. He prays, God, let the counsel he gives be poor counsel. And so he prays that Ahithophel's counsel will not be good and that Absalom will follow this poor counsel. But actually, his prayer does not work out that way. The, the counsel Ahithophel gives Absalom is actually very good counsel, and yet Absalom doesn't heed it. And so, while Ahithophel gives him good counsel, Ahithophel actually does the opposite and does not do that wise counsel, and the plans don't succeed. Because of that, Ahithophel, well, he, he's dejected. He's not only betrayed David, but his counsel was not heeded. And so, he goes from that place, and he hangs himself. And it paints a picture of one that's going to come later, the same thing's going to happen. And it's that scripture that Jesus actually goes back and quotes here, that that passage actually leads up to the Messiah, which is really about me. And so he, he quotes Psalm 41.9, which in that passage, it says this, even my close friend of whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. A prediction of actually what would happen to Jesus Himself, this person who eats his bread at the table will betray Jesus, which is interesting, lift his heel against me. That might kind of escape us. Now, a couple of reasons why that language is used. First of all, in many cultures, including the culture of the first century, to point your heel at somebody was a sign of disrespect. And so if you sat cross-legged and you point your heel at somebody, it was actually dishing somebody else, dissing them. It, uh, really a sign of disrespect. And so that's part of what's going on here. But more than that, the language that's used is actually the, the language of a horse kicking its master. And it could be even a, a deadly blow. And that's the picture we get here, really, that one that's kicking and, and delivering a death blow against his master. And so Jesus says, do you realize that one of you is going to turn its heel? The one who's eating bread at my table is going to turn its heel against me. And Jesus reveals this. And he also says why he reveals this. And I don't want you to miss verse 19. I think this is going to help us in other areas if we realize what Jesus says right here in verse 19. Jesus says, I've revealed this to you for this purpose. I'm telling you this in verse 19. I'm telling you this now before it takes place. And here's what I want you to notice. That when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Now understand he's saying that scripture, that was talking about me. But again, the language he's using here is that language of actually the language of God. I am the I am. I am he. I am that man. So when this prophecy is fulfilled, you'll know. I'm the person that Scripture talks about, but I want you to notice the nature of prophecy. You look at that verse, the nature of prophecy is this. It's not so we can figure out the whens, the who, what, whys. It's not really so we can figure out when that event will occur. When we look at this, we realize that the purpose of prophecy is not as much for us to figure out when it will happen or what's going to happen or exactly the details, but to show us when it happens that God the one who gave us the prophecy has things figured out. You see, when we see the fulfillment of prophecy, we can go back and say, oh, that was God who told us that. And so let me say it again, maybe a different way. The purpose of prophecy is not so we can figure out all the details or when things are going to happen, but when it does happen, we'll stop and say, God knew all along. That was what was going to happen. And now we realize that he does know what's going on. He's had a hand in this. And so Jesus says, I'm telling you this, not so you can figure out who it is, exactly what's going to happen, but when it does happen, you'll know, and here's what you'll know. You'll know that I am he. I am that man. And so he reveals his betrayer. He foretells the darkness. But then something amazing happens. Judas is going to betray him, but Judas is overwhelmed with sorrow when that happens. And let me say it this way. Darkness was felt. After Jesus said these things, Jesus was troubled in his spirit. Now, we've seen that word before. Actually, we've seen that word now three times in the book of John used of Jesus. That word troubled, it, it's stirred up, it's agitated, it's greatly distressed. In fact, this is emotional turmoil, if you will, and it is used three times of Jesus. The first time, we can go back to the death of Lazarus. And so his friend has died. He, he knows he's going to raise Lazarus from the dead, but he comes, he sees Mary weeping. His friend has died, and we see 
Jesus is greatly disturbed. He's really troubled by the death of his friend. And so at that moment, Jesus wept. And we see that word again used of Jesus. This time he realizes he is now on the way to the cross. He realizes what's going to happen. He is going to be betrayed, but more than that, he's going to be killed. He's going to suffer. Even worse than that, we realize Jesus knows he's going to be separated from the Father. And the thought of that, Jesus being separated from the Father, we read he's greatly troubled in his spirit. What's interesting is we see it here also. The fact that Judas is going to betray him, it moves him deeply. He's crushed. And again, I'm going to suggest to you that even Judas, Jesus loves deeply. And the thought of his friend, Judas, betraying him, it overwhelms him. He's not troubled for himself. He's troubled for his friend. He's troubled for another, even the one who would deliver him to death. Even though he knows Judas is going to betray him, the knowledge of that fact does not make the situation any less troubling. And throughout this passage, I'm going to suggest to you again, Jesus is trying to show Judas his love over and over again. In fact, I've got to take you back to put this in context. I've got to take you back to the beginning of chapter 13. Beginning of chapter 13, verse 1, we read this phrase, Jesus loved them to the end. And we talked about that phrase last week, this word end. It's to the conclusion, to the the full but more than that, it's to the uttermost, to, the, to the, the, the full extent. Jesus loved his disciples to the very end, the very last moment. He showed the full extent of his love. And here's the amazing thing. Jesus loves Judas. He's tore apart by the fact that Judas is going to betray him. And Jesus, one more time, is reaching out to him and saying, do you realize how much I love you? Do you realize he's given him the seat of honor? He's washed his feet. He's showing them the full extent of his love. It's been demonstrated by washing the feet of all the disciples. Remember, he washes the feet of Thomas the doubter. He washes the feet of Peter the denier. He washes the feet of these disciples who happen to be at that very moment arguing about who the greatest is. He even washes the feet of Judas the betrayer. Notice the acts of love. Around that table, he's already, he's already given some veiled warnings. Not all of you are clean. You need to be washed. And now he sets Judas in the place of honor. He still loves Judas. He's still reaching out to Judas. And, and then it gets even greater than that. At that table, he feeds the very first morsel to Judas. Now, we read that as the sign, right? Jesus has told John, here's the one, whoever's going to get the, the morsel, I feed him. And Jesus does go and feeds Judas the first morsel, and none of the disciples get that, which may seem a little strange to us. Jesus has said, hey, whoever I give the first morsel to, he's the guy. And then Jesus gives the first morsel to, to, the, uh, to, to Judas, and the disciples don't get it. And you might be thinking, why in the world don't they get this? They haven't got a lot of things, but this seems kind of obvious, doesn't it? But here's what we, we don't realize. Judas is sitting in the place of honor. Here's the other thing you don't realize. Actually... Here's what you're supposed to do to your closest friend. Here's what what you're supposed to do at that meal. Here's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to take the position of honor, and the host will give him the first morsel. And so even though Jesus says it, and even though Jesus does it, they don't get it. They're thinking, okay, who comes next? Who's going to get the next morsel? Because we realize Judas is at the place of honor. And think about this for a second. I'm going to ask you again. You know the answer. Where's Judas seated? In the place of honor. In the place of honor. And the disciples... They don't think anything of that. See, the truth of the matter is, that's where they expect Judas to be. I mean, he is the treasure. He's the the one that's that's trusted. He's the respected one. And we realize that he is getting this, this toast of friendship, and nobody thinks otherwise of that. Jesus feeds him the first morsel to his friend. And I'm going to suggest to you that that gesture is not feigned. Jesus is troubled over this moment. He's honoring Judas, and you might say, why? Jesus offers him again an act of friendship. It's not feigned, unlike what will happen later that very evening when Judas will betray Jesus with another act of friendship. But this one is feigned. He's going to betray Judas with a kiss. And to me, it's an amazing thought. Jesus knows Judas is going to betray him. And yet, what what does Jesus do repeatedly? He shows his love to Judas again 
and again and again. Jesus loved Judas, which is a great thought because I've got to stop and say, Jesus loves us too. No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, no matter what your background, no matter what black marks you have against you, no matter what your track record is, Jesus loves you. He longs for you. In fact, we read in Romans chapter 5 that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, the purpose Jesus came was to give us life a ransom for many. The reason Jesus came was to die for you, even though you're not deserving, even though you're not worth it. Jesus came and loved you so much that Jesus Christ came and gave his life for you. He loves you. And that's why he goes through with what happens that very evening. But Jesus Christ died for us, and we see even now when Judas is going to betray him, all Jesus acts of compassion. He's he's washing his feet. He's sitting him at the place of honor. He's feeding him the first morsel. He's calling him friend. Jesus is still showing his love towards Judas, and yet all those acts of compassion, they're lost on Judas. The night was dark. At that point in our story, darkness fell. After Jesus gives the morsel to Judas. Judas takes that morsel. Satan enters him, and Jesus says to him, what you're going to do, go do quickly. Now, earlier we read already in John, Satan had already put this thought into his heart. Satan had already really enticed Judas to go and betray Jesus. In fact, more than that, Judas had actually even acted on that. He's gone and made arrangements with the priest about how much silver he'd get and all those kind of things. And so the devil's put it into his heart. He's acted upon that. He's made arrangements with the priest. But Jesus continues to give him every opportunity to change his course. He's showing his love over and over again for him. But Judas is resolute. He's made his mind up. He's made his choice. And what's interesting is Jesus actually releases him to that choice. So Judas takes the morsel. He eats it. And that moment... Satan entered into him. An interesting word. It means to enter or to go into or even take the possession of. Judas has entertained the thought. He's even acted upon the thought. But now Satan takes control of him, and Judas goes out from that very place to betray Jesus. Jesus looks at him and says, okay, what you're going to do, do quickly. Again, another interesting word, and I would actually translate it a little bit differently. It's not just the word do quickly. It's actually do this more quickly. Or you could translate it this way. What you're going to do, you go and do faster, or you get on with great haste to do this. Probably even for this fact, he's already made the arrangements. He's already got a set time. He's probably thinking sometime way after dinner, he's going to go out from that place and go after dinner and go betray Jesus. And Jesus actually says before dinner, after the first bite, hey, you go do it now. Actually, Jesus from that moment, and notice what Judas is going to miss. He's going to miss the Last Supper with Jesus. He's also going to miss, well, the breaking of bread And Jesus Jesus explaining, this is my body broken for you. This is my blood. Judas is going to miss all that. Because Jesus says, you go do it and you do it, go do it right now. You get on with this plan. And the, the amazing thing, Judas leaves and even now, no one expects it. Even now the disciples are saying, I wonder what Judas is up to. Jesus says, you go do and do it quickly. Well, Jesus is Judas is the money keeper. Maybe he's going out to to buy supplies for for the, the rest of that, that great weekend. Or it was one of those things during the Passover, you're supposed to give an offering to the poor. And so maybe Judas is going out to do that. Jesus is giving instruction, hey, it's the Last Supper. You go out and you give the offering, prescribed offer to the poor. And so they think Judas is going on with business. You see, here's the point. They don't get it. And the reason is because he's the last one they expect. This is Judas. This is the one at the seat of honor. This is Judas. This is the one who's the treasurer. This is Judas, and we may not know it, but they did. Judas is the man of high education there. Judas is the man with the highest social standing. You see, Judas was not from Galilee. He had a better address. He was from Kirioth. He was a respected man. He's the one that really has been put in charge of much things. And so from their perspective, they think this is the last person that would betray Jesus. You see, actually, Judas among us today, he'd be the one wearing a suit. He'd have the, the position of authority. He's the one everybody would look at and say, he's the most respected man in our community. He's the one that's highly educated. Don't you realize who that is? That's Judas. That's what they were thinking. And yet, we know that Judas is the one who, although he's close to Jesus and he's one of his disciples, his heart is very much far away. 
the most respected among them is actually the one that's going to betray Jesus. And even then, we, we, we've got to realize that J- Judas leaves, nobody expects this. Jesus knows this, but he doesn't make it known to anybody else. He doesn't rat Judas out. Actually, he has given opportunity upon opportunity upon opportunity to come clean and to change course. Jesus, even now, continues to love Judas. In fact, just think about all of love's last appeals. He knows Judas is going to betray him, and yet this is what Judas does, Jesus does that very night. Jesus washes the feet of Judas. He gives this veiled warning, not all of you clean. You need to be clean. Then he sits Judas in the place of honor. He gives him some more unveiled warnings. The first one was kind of cryptic, but now he says, one of you will betray me. This person who I give this bread to is going to betray me. He gives it to Judas. He feeds Judas the first morsel. Jesus is visibly troubled. John writes, he's troubled at his very core. He's troubled in spirit. He speaks quietly so nobody else knows. And then finally, Jesus releases Judas. Your heart's hard? I'm going to turn you over to your hard heart. And he releases Judas without telling anybody else what's going on. You see, it's love's last appeal. As I look at this story, I see Judas the betrayer. But I also I see, see Jesus who loves Judas to the very end. He shows him the full extent of his love. And I just want to stop and say, do you realize how much Jesus loves you? No matter who you are, no matter what you've done, Jesus is giving you an opportunity. He's saying, do you realize what you mean to me? And I'm going to suggest to you that Jesus wants to sit you in the place of honor, that he wants to dress you in the finest robes, that Jesus wants to celebrate with you. Look, here's one of mine who was lost, but now he's found. Jesus loves you. You're loved by Jesus. And so as I look at this passage, I see the terrible thing that Judas does, but I also see wonderful applications. First of all, do you understand how much Jesus loves you? He went to the cross for you. I also look at this passage and and realize that he loves us to the very end. Do you realize the great lengths that he went through for you? I'm going to say, you need to understand that. There's a second application, and I think this is interesting too. You need to understand, I think this passage reveals for us how Satan works. You see, Satan kind of tempts us, gives us opportunities. But if you open the door and you let Satan in even a little bit, Satan operates this way. Give him an inch and he'll take a mile. Give him a foothold and he'll barge right in and take advantage of you. That's how Satan operates. And so we just need to realize that. I see that in this passage. You give Satan a a foothold and he'll step through it. But there's, there's one other thing, and I've alluded to this several times. Do you realize that proximity to Jesus doesn't mean you're a follower of Jesus? Do you realize that being in the proximity of other Christians doesn't cut it? You can be among God's people and still be very far away from him. And actually, as we look at the story, we realize the one they probably least expected to betray Jesus was actually the very one who did betray Jesus. Uh, The very one who you'd look at and say, well, he's a Christian of fine integrity. He's the person that's most respected, the highest educated, the one that we'd least expect to betray Jesus is the very one who does that. And so I want to suggest to you that proximity with other Christians doesn't cut it. What matters is, are you really... Are you really with him? Just being among God's people is not good enough. You can be among God's people and still be very far away. But actually what we read in this passage is, well, your actions are going to determine where you are. You need to realize that you've got to demonstrate you are in the light by walking in the light. Are you really living for Jesus Are you really living as a Christian or just living among Christians? As we read the story for Judas, it's a sad commentary. For Judas, it was a very dark night. 